the bones of Joseph. I know for a fact I have never preached on the bones of Joseph before. I've preached on the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel 37 many, many times, but I've never preached on the bones of Joseph. And I want to tell you what, where this came from. Missy and I were taking some classes uh, last year into the beginning of this year, and the professor mentioned this one day just as kind of an aside about the bones of Joseph, and it just sort of caught my attention. I scribbled it down on my notepad and later on began to think about it, and I've been studying, and I've developed this into a series, and so I just want to launch right into it if I can. That is uh, an Egyptian sarcophagus. We don't know who it is, but I can go ahead and assure you that's not Joseph, so that's fine. Don't worry about that. Who, who is Joseph? Who are you talking about? Joseph was one of the 12 sons of a man named Jacob, and uh, as a matter of fact, he was the 11th son. He was almost the youngest and uh, his brothers were not his actual blood brothers so much as they were half-brothers or step-brothers. And uh, they hated Joseph. And at age 17, Joseph probably showed a lack of wisdom because God gave him a dream about what was going to happen in his future. And the dream was that Joseph was going to be elevated to a high position and that his brothers were actually going to come and bow down to him. And so with a lack of wisdom and possibly a little bit of pride, Joseph told his brothers about the dream. How many of you know when you're 17 years old, you don't want to twel- tell guys in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, one day you're going to bow down to me? It's probably not going to work out very good. I'll go ahead and tell you. Even if that is what's going to happen, it's probably not going to work out very good. So they sold him into slavery, and he found himself in Egypt, far away from his homeland, Israel, Goshen, or not Goshen, but uh, Israel. And uh, in Egypt, he was sold as a household slave. Uh, He stayed a slave for a while. He was then falsely accused of rape, which he did not commit. He never even touched this woman. But for that, he was in prison. And so it sure seemed like that Joseph's dream of being in a high position was never going to come to pass, especially sitting in a prison cell. But how many of you know where you are today doesn't necessarily have to be where you are tomorrow? Because I think this series is all about positioning, as it were. And Joseph would find himself, as a matter of fact, uh, in a position of authority. And one of my favorite stories in the Bible is when Joseph is sitting in his prison cell. And how many of you know prison guards don't knock before they enter your cell? Well, I, I don't know that. I've never been in a prison cell. But I'm guessing they don't tap, 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 do you mind if I come in? And I imagine in an Egyptian prison, as a matter of fact, they probably kick the door open and growl or yell at them. What do you think about that? And as the guard walked into Joseph's cell, he said, get up. He said, shave. He said, change your clothes. And he brought him to see Pharaoh. In an instant, his position changed. In an instant, his position changed. He found himself the prime minister. And sure enough, his brothers came, didn't recognize him, and bowed down to him. All of them did, and the dream came true. The dream wasn't that people would bow to Joseph. The dream was that God had a plan, and he was going to use Joseph. So if you're wanting to be high and elevated, this series of messages is not for you. If you're wanting to be used of God, listen up. There might be something in here that will help you. At the end of Joseph's life, as a a matter of fact, the Bible said he died at, at age 110, I believe. Read these with me. Watch this. Uh, Genesis 50 and 24. Now, uh, his brothers have been living in Egypt. Uh, God moved the whole family, Jacob and all of his brothers and their wives and children and their flocks and herds to Egypt to take care of them during a famine. So now we're years and years and years later and Joseph is about to die. So here's what he said to his brothers. Soon I will die, but God will surely come to help you. And if you don't get anything else out of all of this, I want you to key in on that phase that God is about to do something great. Okay? I want you to get a hold of that with me. I want you to get a hold of that. God will surely come to help you and lead you out of this land of Egypt. He will bring you back to the land he solemnly promised to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. That's Israel. Verse number 25, please. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath. Now, that's pretty powerful stuff back in that day. Swear an oath. He said, when God comes to help you and lead you back, 
you must take my bones with you. Verse number 26. So Joseph died at the age of 110. The Egyptians embalmed him, and his body was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Pastor, what in the world are you preaching on? Well, I want to start with this idea right here, and that is that plans change. Somebody say that out loud, please. Plans change. Because when Joseph was sold into slavery at 17, I'm sure he cried a few tears. I'm sure he felt pretty bad because his brothers had betrayed him, and he didn't know if he was ever going to see his father again. His mother had died in childbirth with his little brother Benjamin. So Joseph had already known some trauma and some problems, and so at age 17, he finds himself sold into slavery. Then the Bible goes on and teaches us that even though he's a slave, God's hand is on him and God is favoring him, and he begins to rise in his position. He begins to be elevated and promoted, and things get a little bit better for Joseph until the man who owns him, his wife, starts trying to seduce him. A lot of you know this story, so I'm giving you a short version. She continually tries to seduce him, and he continually resists her, and finally she gets angry with him and accuses him of rape, and he finds himself in prison. And so once again, I'm sure Joseph has some sleepless nights and some tears that he cries and some things that he feels terrible about. My family's gone. I can't see my father, and I'm unjustly accused. But Joseph is a slave, and Joseph is in prison according to the plan of God because God had moved him there. But then sooner or later, sometime plans change. Somebody say that out loud, please. Plans change. And what's been stirring in my spirit, not just this week, but even sooner than this is, where you are right now might not be where God wants you to be next. And I'm not necessarily talking about moving to a different place or a different job or a different state. And I certainly don't want you to leave Living Faith Church. Somebody say amen, please. But I'm talking about the position in your life, the thing that's going on in your life right now might change if you might could allow God to get in and work his plan because God sent Joseph into Egypt to preserve his people. Joseph was the reason Egypt didn't starve. When Joseph stood before Pharaoh, Pharaoh told him his dream, and Joseph said, you're going to have seven years of bumper crops. You're going to grow so much produce in the next seven years, you're not going to know what to do with it. But after that, you're going to have seven years of the worst famine this land has ever seen. The famine will be so bad, it will eat up all that grew in the first seven years, and you won't even remember unless you do that. This. And God gave him a plan. And he gave that plan to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh elevated him to be the prime minister. He became the number two man in Egypt, and he began to stockpile grain and stockpile the things that were growing. So after the seven years of bumper crops, and the, they entered the seven years of famine, Egypt did not starve. The problem was the famine reached out further than just Egypt. And jo- Joseph's people, Joseph's father and his brothers, they were also starving. And they came down to Egypt to buy grain, the Bible said. And again, some of you know the story, so I'm going fast. And so God had moved him ahead at age 17 and put him in a place and said, I need you here right now, and I'm going to use you. And then your people, they're going to stay here for a while in Egypt, but they're not going to stay forever because I've promised them a homeland. I've promised them an inheritance. And even though I moved your people here for a time, I'm getting ready to move them back out to another place. Now, living faith in the life of Sean and Missy, we are so ready to step up to that next place. Amen, somebody? Are you wanting to leave this church? No, absolutely not. I'm wanting to step up to a new realm in the Spirit. I'm wanting to step up to a new place in my ministry. I'm wanting to step up to a new place in my devotion life, in my walk with Christ, in my life in the Holy Spirit. Is this, is this anybody or am I just preaching to myself? I mean, I, I want to see some plans change. And God's getting ready to move them up, and he's getting ready to move them out. Somebody say out. Somebody say up. And I have felt so strongly about this message. I just pray that I preach it in a way that it ministers to you. Exodus chapter 12, verse number 40 in the New Living Translation says this. The people of Israel, that's the Jews, the Israelites, these are the, the people that came in, Joseph's family. The people of Israel had lived in Egypt for 430 years. Next verse, please. 
In fact, it was on the last day of the 430th year that the Lord's forces left the land. If you really know your Bibles, you know that they celebrated the Passover and they left the next morning. Passover is the first of the year. He says, in one night, in one night, over 400 years of slavery ended. Why are you guys so quiet? Man, I thought this was going to be a great Yahoo screaming, running around the room message. People are going to be shouting and hollering and carrying it on. Y'all just sitting there staring at me. I said, in one night, 430 years of slavery ended. I said, in one night, 400 plus years of slavery ended. Why? Because it was God's time. And it was God's sovereign plan. And it wasn't going to happen, Pastor Wilson, not one day sooner. Not one day sooner it was not going to happen. But on the day that God decreed, it was going to happen. And living faith, I so sense in my spirit, down in the very depths of my soul, that in some of your lives, there's about to be an opening of doors. There's about to be a breaking of chains. I mean, I'm just, I'm just walking around this church during the week, coming in and out of this sanctuary, praying and praising and seeking, walking laps around this sanctuary, praying over every one of these pews, laying hands on these pews, walking around this building, praying, saying, God, would you just reveal destiny to some people who feel like they've been in a position for so long they can never get out of it, but in one night, God can end 400 plus years of slavery. And this morning, this morning I was reading my, my one-year Bible. Not New Year Bible, my one-year Bible. And this morning I'm reading. They're taking a census. And they're taking a census of the tribes. And I, I added them all up one time just to make sure that the guy who translated that part of the Bible got it right. Because from the tribe of Judah, they had so many hundred thousand men. And all they counted was the fighting men. And, and, and when they left out of there and began the Exodus journey, they had over 600,000 fighting men. They didn't count the wives. They didn't count the children. And in a one night... Freedom came to over 2 million people. Where are you in your life and what needs to change and where are you ready to go in God? Now, if you're going to go, then it's time to pack. Amen, somebody? It might be time to pack. Somebody this morning, uh, Brent, in the men's small group was sharing, they're, they're getting ready to to move, we're going to lose one of our families we love. Praise God, they'll, they'll find a church up there. And God will raise somebody up in their place. Amen, somebody? Amen. Praise the Lord, and we'll let you know as we get sooner to that date. But he was talking about packing, and Lord have mercy. Missy and I are still unpacking boxes because we just moved. Does anybody else hate packing? And, and, and when you pack, have you noticed you put something in a box and you think, oh, I'll remember where I put that. And you seal it up, and you write some of the stuff that's in the box, but you don't write that one thing you're looking for. I'm still looking for the cord for the music system on our TV. I'm still looking for the cord. I'm still looking. Why did I pack the music system, the, the surround sound thingamajig that I use, why did I put it in one box and put the cord somewhere else? And I did, this is, I'm not making this up. This is the truth. I'm just yelling at myself, Sean, what is wrong with you? How stupid can you possibly be? So you start thinking about getting ready to move, and you start thinking about where you're going to go, and it, it's time to pack. So if we're going to go to a different, living faith, please listen to me. I ain't got much left to preach. I'm, I'm almost out of outline here. So listen, this stuff's important. If, if we're going to go somewhere and we need to pack, what do we need to take? What do we need to take? What do we need? There we go. Thank you. Always, I got 200 out-of-work comedians in this church. This is my stage, my sermon, my time. Thank you very much. So what are we going to take? Last week, I preached about the church. I preached about advancing against the gates of hell. I pr the, you got to move. You got to advance. So if we're going to go to a new place as a church, you're going to go to a new place as a person. What are you going to take? What are you going to take? A couple of times we've gone out of town. And how many of you, when you go out of town, you go somewhere? Once you get there, get in the hotel, campground, whatever. The first place you go is Walmart. 
just want to make sure, because you forgot something, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. Aggravating, isn't it? I do it every time. First place we go is Walmart. And, and I hate that. We got a Walmart here in Rankin. I don't need to go to Walmart. I want to go to the lake or whatever. So what are we going to take? And I got thinking about this. Exodus 13 and 19, watch this. Now we're in Exodus. This is actually when it happened. Moses, y'all kind of remember him, I'm sure. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear to do this. He said, God will, somebody read this out loud, starting with God. You ready? Here we go. God will certainly come to help you. Somebody here this morning besides me needs to take that right there as a prophetic message in your life. If I've ever brought you a word from God, it's this morning. You need to take that as a prophetic message. God will certainly come to help you. God is not done in your existence. He's not done in your life. When he does, you must take my bones with you from this place. Now, some of you historians and scholars probably know that the Egyptians kind of perfected the art of embalming. They were doing it thousands of years ago, and those bodies lasted an incredible amount of time. When we were trying to come up with this artwork for the whole series, Pastor Breck and Nick were shooting me some photos and some pictures, and, and one of them was a picture of a skull. Pastor Breck wanted to use a skull for this to do this, and I thought, no, there's no way we're using a skull. We're not a biker gang in here for Pete's sake. We're a church. And so I, I sent it back. I said, a skull, really? Seriously? And, and he said, well, think about it. it. It would have been a skull. There wouldn't have been any skin on the bones. I said, no, no, no. The Egyptians knew what they were doing. That, that skin was probably like leather right there. So, you know, you think about it, it's certainly a little bit maudlin, a little bit frightening, I guess you could say, but they literally picked up that sealed casket that they had put his body in, and they took it with him. They took the bones. Now, say, say the word bones out loud, please, because if I didn't have bones in my body, I would just collapse. Amen. So bones kind of form the structure of an organism, and without bones, most organisms can't function. Now, I know some of you would run up to me after service immediately and say, oh, bugs don't have bones. They have an exoskeleton or a slug or a worm or something like that. I'm talking about human beings. Listen to the sermon. Don't think about the other stuff, okay? So you need bones for the thing to be uh, to, to, to function. I, my wife and I really like to watch the show Flea Market Flip. I think it's one of the few shows left on TV where they don't have to bleep out every other word. I think so. And plus, we learn something. And I like, to, I like to restore old furniture, and I like to repurpose furniture. And I learned something from Lara on that show. She says a piece has good bones. That means that even on the outside, it might be rough or rusty or, or the paint's faded or chipped or anything. The structure of it is solid, and you can build something out of it. And so I want to look at what are the bones of Joseph for Living Faith Church. What critical things do we need to take on this journey if we're going to go? And, and, and maybe, even, listen to this, listen, listen, listen. Hey, listen. Maybe, what about some things we don't need to take? What about some things we need to leave behind? How many of you overpack when you go on a trip? Listen, I am learning to pack light, baby. I just don't feel like carrying it. My son learned it when he was like six. The very first time he ever went to youth camp, Missy folded him up five pristine white tiny little pairs of underwear. Somebody say amen. Stacked them up in the corner of his little suitcase. Here you go, one for each day. Andrew came home with five pristine white little <laughs> pairs of underwear. Didn't need a one of them. Or so he thought. That also is a true story, and I hope he's watching online right now. I really do. But now let's get serious for one more second before I quit this message and, and, and I'm done. What are some things we need to leave behind? Jesus said to some people, they're called Pharisees in Luke 11 and 46. He said this. Um, have you got me, bro? Luke 11 and 46. There you go. Thank you. That's okay. Everybody, he, he said, Jesus said, what sorrow also awaits you experts in religious law. Somebody say religious law. 
For you crush people with unbearable religious demands, and you never lift a finger to ease the burden. And I think some of us are walking under burdens, maybe some guilt that somebody laid on us, or we laid on ourselves, some memories of our past. Maybe some of us are got some, I, I, I got this from the Lord, we got some bad doctrine as a child preached to us. And we're in some religious bondage. We're letting some things that people laid on us that are not really realistic. They're not biblical. And they're, they're weighing us down. And if we're going to go up and go out, I think it's time to leave some stuff behind. And pack light and make the trip a little easier. Some junk that somebody laid on you or you laid on yourself. Why don't you just go ahead and leave that in Egypt while you head on out to what God has for you? Holy Spirit, reveal to us the things that are burdening us down. Because I don't know what's going on in your existence. And I don't know what your past looks like. I know what my past looks like. And I know sometimes I let it climb back up on my back as a burden. Amen, anybody? Anybody? Sometimes I do that. Hello, somebody. But I don't know what your past looks like, so I'm praying that the Spirit of God reveal to you some things that it's okay for you to leave behind. Don't pack them. You don't need them. And then Jesus also said something else that I really love in Matthew 9 and 17. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. For the old skins would burst from the pressure. Why? The skin is dried up. It's, it's, it's cracked. It's, it's, it's old. It can't hold the, uh, <clears throat> the chemical process known as fermentation. And it will burst it. And he said you would spill the wine and ruin the skins. New wine is stored in new wine skins so that both are preserved. <clears throat> now, I don't know about you, but for the last two weeks I've been praying Lord, over my life and over my wife and my family and my church, open the heavens and bless us. Amen, anybody else? And then I've been praying, Holy Spirit, move in my life in a brand new way. And then I've been praying, Father, speak into my spirit. And I've been praying that for 14 days, and I believe he's hearing and he's answering. So I don't know about you, but I am ready for some new wine. I mean new wine of the Spirit. I'm not talking about alcohol. I mean new wine of the Spirit. I'm ready for some new wine of the Holy Spirit, y'all. I'm praying and seeking, and and maybe there's some old wineskins I need to lay down, and maybe there's some old burdens that I need to lay down, and some old guilt that I need to lay down, and some memories that I need to lay down, and some bad doctrine that somebody beat me up with, some religious bully who beat me up with some teaching, and I have lived my life under condemnation thinking I'm not good enough because so-and-so said such and such. It's time to leave that stuff in Egypt and start walking in the Holy Spirit, in the freedom that he has for us. Because my salvation is not dependent upon what a preacher said in my background or in my past. And my salvation is not dependent on what my mom and dad said or did or anybody else. My salvation is dependent on the cross, the blood, and the Holy Spirit. And that's it. So maybe it's time you leave some stuff behind because Joseph said God will surely visit you. Not maybe, not possibly, not if he feels like it. Joseph prophesied. He said God's going to get in this thing. God's going to get in this thing. God's going to get in your life. God's going to get in your stuff. God's going to get in your existence. He's on his way. Don't give up on him. He's not going to leave you where you are. You say to me, well, you're not Joseph and we're not Israel. You can't take Joseph's prophecy for us. Okay, fine. How about another guy whose name starts with J? Jesus. Amen. Anybody ever heard of him? Matthew chapter 5, verse number 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. I'm hungry and I'm thirsty for this. I'm hungry and I'm thirsty for this. And I've got to have a fresh a fresh dose. I don't know what the, even the word I'm looking for of his presence. Joel, come play. 
I always preach better when you play, son. You got an anointing on you. <clears throat> and he does. He's like David, but I ain't Saul. Okay? Saul tried to kill David, and I, I love you. <laughs> I need you. <laughs> don't, don't make that inference, you Bible scholars. So same as my message title, just this last point right quick. Let's, let's start the journey. Anybody else interested in this? Let's start the journey. Now, I love, <clears throat> I love Joseph's faith before he dies. Breck, I love, he, he looks at his brothers and he said, listen, I know I'm going to be dead, but I still don't want to miss what God's going to do. Take me with you. Take me with you. I want to go home. I want to go to the promised land. I want to be a part of God's promise. I don't want to miss. Oh, somebody get this. I don't want to stay in Egypt for nothing. There's the ending I was looking for. I drove in this morning and I told Missy, I do not know how I am going to end this message. She said, what do you mean? You're just starting. It's a brand new series. I said, I do not know how to end this sermon this morning, this message this morning. And right now, the Spirit of the Lord is, is, is just speaking to me so rapidly that it, it looks like a coffin. It looks like a coffin. It's nothing but bones in it. There's a dead body. There's nothing but, but bones in there. But by faith, Joseph prophesied and said, God's going to get in this thing. God's going to get in this thing. Take me with you. I want to be a part of it. I want to experience it. I don't want to stay back in Egypt. I want to go where God's got us going. Can anybody hear me this morning? Is this resonating in your spirit? What's the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now? What's the Holy Spirit saying in your spirit this morning? What's he saying to you? Joseph's faith, take me with you. And it was critical to the Jewish people that they took that casket with them. So last week I was talking about our church, living faith, advancing against the powers of hell. And I'm here to tell you today that I'm on a journey. Will you accept that from me, please? I personally am on a journey, but I also believe that this church is on a journey. How many of you witnessed that statement right there? This church is on a journey. So what are the things, what are the things that are critical to us? What are the things that are critical to us? So I'm in my office this week, and I, I pace a lot. Um, who's on camera this morning? I can't even see back there in the shadows. A couple of weeks ago, Jacob was on camera, and uh, he said, Pastor, I love you. Now, how many of you know when somebody says, Pastor, I love you, they're fixing to fuss at you? <laughs> he said, it is so hard to follow you when you move around with this camera, and I said, I can't help it. I can't help it. I got to move while I preach. That's just, I can't do it. Y'all could try and nail my feet to the floor, I guess, and I'd still pull them out. But I pace in my office. I pace around this church. I pace in this sanctuary. I just pace. I don't sit down good. I don't rest good. I'm just That's just not my personality. I was walking in my office, and I was thinking about this verse of Scripture I'm about to throw up there for you, and, and I, I, said, I said, Lord, we need an encounter. And I was talking to the Lord, and, and he interrupted me, Immediately, he, he said this to me, you do not need an encounter. You need a relationship with me. And here's what he showed me. We come in here in living faith, and we are so blessed. We have such an anointed worship service that we get to enjoy. Can anybody else say amen to that? We flow in the power of the Spirit. The singing is not just a show. It's just not just about personalities and, 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 and talent, but we flow in, the, in the, the Spirit, and we experience the Spirit, and I'm, I'm Spirit-filled, and I, I enjoy it, but some people who come in here, they, they're not getting this all week long because they don't flow in the Spirit. They're not Spirit-filled, or they, they're not pursuing God. You see, I can have, no offense, I mean, I love our musicians and singers and what we do, but I can have just as good a time riding my lawnmower as I can in here. Can anybody witness that? I mean, I can get right in the presence of God. Last Saturday, I was out in my shop, and I was actually absolutely covered with man glitter. Somebody say amen, please. Missy showed me this. It's not sawdust. It's man glitter. Because I got saws and drills and tools, and when I come in, I literally, with my compressor, I just have to blow myself off from head to toe because I'm covered in sawdust. If I walk in the house, she gets me. 
And uh, I was just absolutely covered in sawdust and working out there and just in the presence of God, sweaty and nasty. And I mean, I smell like a goat. Come on, help me, somebody. And, but just in the presence of God because I know how to get in his presence. But then we have these worship services, and, and you'll watch it happen. We'll have an altar service, and, and the, the front will fill up, and, and people will be worshiping. And then you'll see people come down, and they'll get touched of the Lord. And oftentimes they'll cry, and they'll pray, and, and they'll feel God's presence, and they'll pray in remorse and, and, and stuff. And they're having an encounter with God, but they don't have a relationship with God. They come in and get blessed by the power of the Spirit because He shows up when we worship Him. But all week long, they're not having that. So they're having an encounter. This is what the Lord showed me in my office. And too many people are coming to church and getting an encounter. And they feel good. And they get a little under conviction. Pray, God, forgive me of my sins. But they don't develop that relationship. And they go back out. And on Monday goes pretty good. Tuesday, eh, not so sure. By Wednesday, they're a train wreck again. I hope I'm not describing you. But if I am, it's because you don't have a relationship. And God said, I don't want my people to have an encounter with me. I want my people to have a relationship with me. Jeremiah, put it up for me, sir. I'm almost done. Jeremiah 2.13. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And hewn, hewn is a word that means cut. They cut themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. A cistern is a type of cave down in the ground. In the Middle East, water is scarce. A couple of years ago, Missy and I went out west for the first time ever. We went to uh, uh, Utah. I remember going in the hotel room and there were signs everywhere, please do not waste water everywhere. We are under a water shortage. Every drop is precious. I mean, it was all over the hotel room. And, you know, over here, we got all this rain and stuff. We just let it go. Run the water all day long if we want to. It's never going to run out. But in the Middle East, water is precious. So anytime they find a natural cave, they will go down in it and plaster it with limestone. And when they infrequently get the rain, it will collect in the cistern. And that's their source of water. That's their source. Somebody say, my source. God said, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the real source, and they have cut themselves broken cisterns that hold no water. They have forsaken me. So it's not about an encounter with God. It's about a relationship with God. God says, what about your relationship? This is the first of these bones of Joseph. I guess the whole message was an introduction, and the actual body of the sermon was just this one verse. Where is your relationship? Are you that person that has the encounter, or are you that person that has the relationship? One more thing, and I'm going to quit. As God led them out of Egypt, he led them into the wilderness. Sometimes before God takes you up, he takes you through. And and, and they, they had to go through the wilderness land, a very dry place, a very dry place. And so my prayer has been for a while now, God, wherever you're leading me as a person, that's fine. As long as you take me to your final destination, I want to go with you. Stand with me, please. I preached a little longer this morning than I normally do. Are you with me still, living faith? Now, what is your source? Do you have a cistern of living water? Or do you have a broken cistern? Are you trying to abide on something other than the presence of God, the relationship? David said in Psalm 63, this is the last scripture I have and I'm done. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul, help me, church. Say it again. My soul thirsts. Say it again. My soul thirsts. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land where there is no, there is no water. Father, today, thank you for giving me the opportunity to preach. But Lord, this sermon is yours. You wrote this. You gave me this. And Lord, now you got to finish it in the hearts of the, and the lives of these believers. you got to do this. I can. I've done everything I know to do. But God, I can say this. I am so ready to start this journey. And if, if, is there anyone else that can say, I am so ready to start this journey?
Or maybe you feel like I've already started the journey, but man, I'm so anxious to get up, get out, and go where God wants us me to go in this church. If that's you, I want somebody. I want somebody with the strength to step out and walk down to this altar and say, I am so ready. There's room for more. There's room for more. There's room for more. There's room for more. Come, come on, come join us. There's room for more. I want to I want to begin to pray right now against some burdens you've been carrying that are going to hinder you, and I want you to leave them behind. I want to pray against guilt in the name of Jesus Christ this morning. There's still room for more people here, church, if you want to come. If something in what I said compelled you, come on down. If something in what I preached today compelled you, come on down. But I want to pray against some guilt that's holding some people back. I want to pray against guilt in the name of Jesus Christ this morning. And then I want to pray against memories in the name of Jesus Christ that are holding people back. And I want to pray against some bad doctrine. I just feel so strongly somebody got some religious junk laid on them when they were a kid or maybe a teenager that has held them back for a long, long time. I want to pray for freedom from that in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, that we would see clearly and walk with a doctrine defined from Scripture and not man. Lord, that we would walk in truth defined from Scripture and not man. Oh, Spirit of the living God. Spirit of the living God. Spirit of the living God. Come on, guys, just pray. Come on, living faith, just pray. Sometimes it's time to sing at the end of the service, but today I believe it's just time to pray. God, lead us up and lead us out. God, lead us up and lead us out. God, lead us up and lead us out. out.